So, Unit 2 is all about the institutions of government and how they react, especially the federal government. So we talked about the legislative, we talked about the presidency, and we talked about the judiciary branch of the United States. Today, we're going to go back to the executive branch because we've only focused on the presidency, but who's also part of the, uh, of the executive branch, so the federal bureaucracy, the agencies and departments of the federal bureaucracy, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today how the federal bureaucracy works, and how they function, and what's their job. So, the federal bureaucracy is part of the executive branch, and it's part of the executive branch, together with the President of the United States, they make sure of the execution, the faithful execution of laws and policies. The federal bureaucracy is part of the executive branch, their job is to execute policy to enforce and execute the policy. They don't make policy themselves, although that's kind of a lie, we'll talk about that later on. Their job, or their main job, is to implement, enforce, and execute policies. All right, when it comes to policies, policies are basically um, decisions that government makes. Policies usually come from who? Which branch of government? The legislative branch, because they make laws. Laws can be policies. So they implement or enforce congressional laws. Laws passed by the legislative branch are usually implemented and enforced by the federal bureaucracy. All right, here's the thing that a lot of you are getting wrong on your FRQ. Legislation comes from which one of these branches? Congress. It comes from Congress. The president doesn't make legislation. He can only recommend them and approve them, and he can also reject them with his veto, but he doesn't make legislation himself. He can recommend them to Congress. He can veto them. He can approve them and sign them into law, but he doesn't make them them himself. Federal courts, what do they do? Do they make laws? Federal courts do not make laws. They make what? They make decisions. They make rulings that carry the force of law, but they're not necessarily legislation. Anybody have any questions on that? So any law passed by Congress, any decision made by the court, any decision made by the president, including what? Issuing a what? Executive order. All of those policies are implemented by who? The bureaucracy. The federal bureaucracy. Any law passed by Congress, any ruling made by the courts, any action taken by the President of the United States, including executive orders, are all implemented and executed by the federal bureaucracy. So all the departments and the agencies of the federal government, that's their job. They take legislation passed by Congress, they take executive orders, they take presidential decisions, they take Supreme Court or court rulings and decisions, and their job is to implement them, make them become reality. So these guys are what we call policy makers. They create the policy, but the people that actually enforces them, makes their, them a reality, is the federal bureaucracy. Their job is to implement and enforce. Any questions? So these guys make the decision, and those decisions are implemented and enforced by the federal bureaucracy. But make sure you know what each one of these policy makers can make, what kind of policy they can make. Congress makes what? Makes laws, makes legislation, the president makes decisions, including what? Executive orders, and federal courts make what? Rulings and decisions that have an impact like a legislation, but they're not legislation themselves. Any questions? And all of those are given to a federal bureaucracy to go ahead and implement and enforce. So usually when a policy gets made, oh by the way guys, today most of the policies that get made actually comes from which branch? Most of them are what? Most of them are Congress's legislation. So when I talk about things right now, I'm mostly going to refer to this. Not so much these two, but I'm going to refer to Congress making legislation and the federal bureaucracy implementing that legislation. All right, so when a policy gets made, when an executive order, a law, or a, or a ruling gets issued out, it is given, or, or that responsibility of implementing that policy is given to a specific agency. So if a policy is about education, who do we give it to? 
the Department of Education. If it's about military, who do we give it to? The Department of Defense. Does that make sense? So a policy gets made by one of the policy makers, by Congress, by the President, or by the, by the courts, and the responsibility of executing that policy is then assigned to a specific agency. And then that agency they have to implement it and achieve whatever goal that policy wants to achieve. What if I don't know, there's a certain policy, but there's no agency that exists that is equipped in, in order to meet or execute that policy? What do we do? We create one. And Congress has the ability to create new agencies. Congress has the ability to create new departments if it wanted to. So if there's no agency that exists, to, in order to implement or enforce that policy specifically, properly, then Congress can just create a new agency that is in order to implement or enforce that particular policy. So I'll give you an example. Late 1950s, the, we were in the middle of the Cold War and the space race began. Um, the space exploration was tasked to the Air Force, uh, that department of the U.S. De Department of Defense, in order to do. But the Air Force is busy doing something else, like protecting the United States from attacks. So what did Congress decide to do? There's this policy existing that we need to go to the moon, so they created a new agency and they created NASA, so that they can implement that policy properly. Any questions? So if no agency exists, Congress can make a new one in order to meet whatever policy or implement whatever policy that needs to be implemented. All right, so let's talk about what are the federal bureaucracies. Federal bureaucracies can be categorized into three types. The top of the top is what we call a department. There are only 15 of these in the United States. They're called cabinet departments. <coughs> Department of State, Department of Education, Department of Agriculture, Department of the Interior, Department of Labor, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, So these are the top dogs. They're usually in charge of a very important policy area like education and defense, and there's usually more agencies underneath them. Yes, sir? Uh, why is Area 51 restricted? I don't know. <laughs> it's not important right now. So departments and agencies aren't the same thing? Think of departments like huge agencies. Okay. They are agencies, but bigger, basically. So, Anybody know what do we call the people that leads these agencies, a leader of each one of these agencies? Yeah. What do we call them? Yeah, they're called secretaries. The department heads are called secretaries. They're led by a cabinet secretary. Like the leader of the Department of State is called the Secretary of State. The leader of the Department of Defense is the Secretary of Defense. So they're all led by a secretary except for one agency. And, I'm sorry, except for one department, and that department would be the Department of Justice. Department of Justice. Okay. Or, uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the Department of Justice is not led by a secretary. Instead, the Department of Justice is led by what we call the Attorney General. The Attorney General. It's not the Secretary of Justice, it's the Attorney General. All right. So, what are the responsibilities of a secretary, of a cabinet secretary? Number one, they're in charge of their department. They lead their department. Usually, depending on the department, multi-billion dollars, a lot of employees. So you're like a CEO of your own department. A secondary job is you're part of the president's cabinet. That's why we call this the, cab uh, the cabinet departments. So your, their secondary job is to advise the president advise the president. So your first job is you're in charge of this multi-million dollar kind of like company or this department with a lot of employees below you and your second job is to become an advisor to the president of the United States. Now the influence over the president of each one of these secretaries vary. Some secretaries are closer to President Trump than other secretaries. Some secretaries he doesn't really care about, so their opinions doesn't matter to him. Some secretaries he's close friends with. Um, who gets to appoint these secretaries, by the way? President. President, with whose approval? The Senate's approval. 
Moving on. Another type of agencies, these are not as big usually as the departments, and they're not in charge of um, two important policy areas, but we call them agencies and commissions. They're in charge of a specific policy area. They're in charge of a specific policy area. There's like hundreds of these agencies and commissions in the federal government. They employ a lot of people. They're in charge of a specific policy area. Like, for example, what's NASA in charge with? What policy area is in charge with? Space. Space, 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 space exploration, yeah. right? CIA is in charge of intelligence gathering. So they have a specific job, they have a specific policy area that they're in charge with. Sir, let's get the best basic knowledge. China, US, Russia. <laughs> other agencies, other, uh, other agencies and commissions, they have another job and that is to regulate. Regulate means control, make rules for. So there are some agencies and there are some commissions that their main job is to regulate a certain sector of the economy. They make rules, they make regulations for a certain sector of the economy. Like for example, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, they make rules about what? The weather. Protecting the environment. Yeah. You got the FDA, the Food and Drug Agency, they make rules about the food and drug industry, for example. They make regulations for the food and drug industry. You got the FCC, they control television. So they're the ones that censor bad words and TV shows, and they want, they're the ones that make sure that commercials are not saying something that's false. So they make rules and regulations for TV and radio. So they're in charge of a certain sector of the economy. Any questions? So, these are in charge of a specific area. They make rules for a certain sector of the economy. They regulate. Move on. Then the third type, and these are less common. These are government corporations. They usually provide a service, but they are run like, not as a government entity, they're run like a private corporation. They make money, they make profit. So think of these as like um, corporations or companies, but owned by whom? The by the government. So they're called government corporations. They run like private companies. Does that include like airlines and all that? No. We don't have an airline, a public airline. Give me the number one example for government corporations. Sorry? The U.S. Postal Service. They provide a service like the FedEx can provide or UPS can provide, but they're a government corporation. So the USPS, the United States Postal Service, would be a government corporation. They are run for profit. Right now they're bankrupt, but they're run for profit. They make money because you have to pay the stampage. Any questions about that? Another company that the government runs is Amtrak. They're in charge of trains in some big cities in the United States. They're usually blamed for being inefficient, usually blamed for not doing a very good job as a private company. That's kind of a lie. Private companies also suck at providing some of these services. But that's what they do. Any questions so far? The thing you need to, uh, to know today is, how do you become part of a federal bureaucracy? How do you become a bureaucrat? So today we're going to talk about civil service employment. Chances are, one of you in this class is going to be an employee of one of these agencies and one of these departments. You're going to be paid a salary by the federal government. You're going to become an employee of the civil service system. So, people that work for one of these agencies and one of these departments are known as civil servants or bureaucrats. Chances are, one of you is going to be a bureaucrat, one of you is going to be a civil servant someday. It used to be that hiring and promotion in the federal bureaucracy was based on one system, and it's called the, uh, pay, the patronage system. You need to know what this means. It used to be that hiring and promotions in the federal bureaucracy are done through the patronage system. This was started by Andrew Jackson. 
who can appoint a lot of these positions? The president. The president can. Before 1877, he can appoint a lot more bureaucrats than he can do now. Right now, he's very limited that he can only appoint people as heads of agencies and heads of departments. But before 1877, he can appoint a majority of these bureaucrats. There weren't a lot of agencies back then, but most of the people that work in the federal bureaucracy is appointed by him. And some of those appointments don't even require Senate approval. So he can appoint whoever he wants. So here's what Andrew Jackson did. When he became president of the United States, he started appointing who? He started appointing his friends. He started appointing people that contributed to his campaigns. And he started firing people that criticized him. So this is called the patronage system. Hiring and promoting based on connections or contributions to a president's campaign. So hiring and promotion, promoting, based on connections with the president or maybe contributions that you made during his election. So that's the only way to get Before. Oh, based on contribution or Sorry? Based on contributions on, um, for a president's campaign. So once he wins, once the president wins, he usually awards bureaucratic jobs to people that help him get there. So that they can have some power and they can have a job. So this is what how the patronage system worked. The president of the United States gets some help during his campaign to become president from a lot of loyal supporters. Sometimes they give him money, sometimes they give him endorsement. When he becomes president of the United States and he has the power to employ a lot of these people, he gives them jobs in return. Anybody have any questions? I don't know if you're high, Daniel, but no more distractions in case we need to focus. All right. How can we limit patronage? Or who can limit patronage? Especially for a lot of the heads of agencies and heads of departments. Give me a check. Senate can, right? So to prevent the president from just hiring his friends and hiring people that he has connections with, the Senate can check that because Senate can confirm appointments to a degree. What if the Senate belongs to the president's party? What happens? There's no check, right? He can just appoint whoever he wants, usually. So what is the result of the patronage system? What happened because of, of this system in the United States? What became of the federal bureaucracy? Because the president is hiring his friends and hiring people that makes contributions. What happened to the federal bureaucracy? It's filled with people who are not qualified to do their job. It became ineffective. Because you have people running these agencies and departments who have no idea what they were doing. They were just put in there because they were friends with the president or they contributed to his campaign. And as a result, a lot of these agencies and departments became highly ineffective. All throughout the 1800s, that's what's happening to the federal bureaucracy. They became inefficient, they became ineffective, and sometimes they became very corrupt. Because they weren't getting hired or promoted based on their skills, based on their merit, based on their expertise, but they were getting hired based on their connections to the presidency. So we're going to change that. In 1877, there was an event that triggered a change. Anybody know what happened in 1876, a year before? One of our presidents gets assassinated. Grover Cleveland gets assassinated. The assassin, when he got captured, he said the reason why he killed the president is he was offered a what? He was offered a job by him, but didn't follow through. So Congress decides we need to change things. So they passed a law called the Pendleton Civil Service Act. That's you have to take the test, right? Exactly. And we're going to replace the patronage system with a new kind of system called the merit system. The purpose is to limit patronage. Not completely eliminate it. There's still some patronage going on right now. But to limit the patronage system and transfer or transition to what we call the merit system. It created what we call the civil service system. You need to remember that, the civil service system. You don't really need to remember this law, what the law is called, but you need to remember what it created. It created the civil service system. 
that would limit patronage and transition the federal bureaucracy to a more effective merit system or merit-based system. So, number one, and you need to know this, number one, the civil service system states that most of the bureaucratic job, not all of them, but most of them will be awarded based on merit, that means based on expertise, based on training, and based on civil service exams like Michelle has alluded to. So it's going to be replaced with the merit system. Promotions and hiring are going to be based on expertise, training, and exams. So nowadays, if you want to become a bureaucrat, you're going to need to train for it. You're going to need to be educated for it. You're going to need to take a test for it. So a lot of these positions are no longer what? They're no longer available for who to appoint? President. President. We're going to take that power away from him. So a majority of the federal bureaucratic positions are no longer appointed by the President of the United States today. There's still some that are appointed by the President of the United States, but very limited because of the civil service system. Most of these jobs now are no longer based on appointment by the President. They are now based on merit, based on your skill, your expertise, your education, and how you do on these bureaucratic or civil service exams that the government issues out. Anybody have any questions? Number two, firing and demotions will be very difficult now. Firing a bureaucrat nowadays in the civil service system, because of the civil service system, is very difficult to do. Even bad ones, it's very hard to remove them from their jobs. Because the thing that happened before the civil service system is, once a new president comes to town, He's just going to start firing people who don't agree with him, firing people from the other party, and replace them with people from his party. So we wanted to prevent that from happening. So most of the jobs that the bureaucrats hold nowadays are safe from the president. And in order to fire them, you're going to have to prove that they were inept and they were not good at their jobs. Any questions? So this is to make the federal bureaucracy less political less about parties, and more about expertise, and more about efficiency. All right, presidential appointments are now reserved just for who? This doesn't mean the president doesn't have any influence on the federal bureaucracy, he still does. He can still appoint people, but now he's limited to appointing who? The heads. The heads of agencies, the secretaries of the departments, he's only limited to employing the heads or the leaders of the agencies and departments. But the lower level positions, that's not up for grabs anymore for him. That's off limits from him now. The heads and the leaders of the agencies and departments, he can still appoint. So he still has some influence. And he can still fire them whenever he wants. But the lower level positions, that's off limits for him now. Any questions? Next. So what is the result of the civil service system? Number one, it enhances. what does the E stand for? Efficiency. efficiency, expertise, and professionalism of the federal bureaucracy. It enhances expertise and professionalism of the federal bureaucracy. No longer are people getting hired and promoted just because they were friends with the president. Now most of these jobs are given or are promoted based on merit. Number two, it allows the federal bureaucracies to specialize because they're filled with experts. They're allowed to specialize in one area now. The Department of Health, medicine. The Department of Education, education. So these agencies and departments are now highly specialized. They're good at what they do. The Department of Health is filled with former doctors, filled with former nurses. The Department of Education is filled with former <coughs> principals and teachers. Expertise, specialization. When before, somebody can get into a, can get a job where he doesn't know what he's doing, he doesn't have expertise in it, now that's no longer possible, especially for the lower level position. And lastly, neutrality. Before, the federal bureaucracy, since they're filled with, the, with people from the president's party, they would make decisions in support of that party or in support of the ideology. No longer. Now, since it's based on expertise, it's based on education and training, um, the federal bureaucracy is more neutral when it's making decisions. It doesn't really consider political parties all that much anymore when making decisions. 
it's more nonpartisan, it's less biased now, because it's not about your party anymore, it's not about how well you suck up to the president. A lot of these lower level positions are given based on merit and expertise. Anybody have any questions? Who is this going to greatly limit? The president. The president's influence over the federal bureaucracy is going to be greatly limited. He still has some influence because he can still hire and fire the heads of agencies and the heads of departments, and they're the ones that lead their agency and departments into a certain direction, but they have less control now. They don't, they don't have influence over the lower level bureaucrats as much. The top levels, yeah, he can still influence because he can fire and hire them, but he has less influence now. Any questions? Moving on. So what does the federal bureaucracy actually do? Some of these federal bureaucracies, they write and enforce what we call regulations. We talked about regulations already. The rules on a certain industry, on a certain, uh, on a certain part of the economy. So they write and enforce regulations. Oh, by the way, these regulations are known as administrative law. Administrative law. They're not legislation passed by Congress, but they're called laws because they carry the force of law. The rules that these agencies make and these departments make, if you violate them, there are consequences. It's just like Congress passing a law. That's why these regulations are known as administrative law. They carry the force of law. The rules that these agencies and department makes carry the force of law. So you said um, some write and enforce law? Regulations. Regulations. And these regulations are known as administrative law. So for example, what kind of regulations does the EPA make? Environmental, Environmental regulations. The Federal Election Commission makes regulations about our election, our election campaign system. So there's certain rules about elections nowadays that these guys come up with, and if a candidate violates it, then they're in violation of a regulation, and they can get punished for that. So they make regulations, and these regulations carry the force of what? Of law. So they, these, these agencies and these departments could be very powerful, depending on what type of rules and regulations that they make. It's basically Congress making a policy or making legislation. All right. When somebody is not obeying their regulations, they can punish them by issuing fines and other punishments. By issuing fines and other punishment. If Hillary Clinton violated one of the election rules that the, the FEC came up with, one of the regulations, she will be fined for it. So keep, as we go to the election of 2020, the FEC is going to be center front because they're going to be making a lot of regulations and you need to be careful as a candidate not to violate some of these regulations that they're making because you could be punished for it by the FEC. All right. And here's something that you should remember. What the federal bureaucracy is for is the reason why we don't let Congress, or we don't let the President, or we don't let the judicial branch execute their own policy is because they lack what? What does the federal bureaucracy has that the policymakers don't have? They lack expertise. Congress and the President might want to go to the moon, but they may lack the expertise to get us there. Who has the expertise to get us there? The NASA does. The bureaucracies do. So what they provide the government is they provide expertise. They provide knowledge that Congress, that the President, and the Supreme Court may not have. So an, uh, a function that a lot of these bureaucrats serve sometimes is when they're talking about a bill in Congress. You guys remember <coughs> committees, right? They do committee hearings and they talk about a bill, whether or not they want to pass it or not. They bring in what? They bring in experts. A lot of these experts come from where? The federal bureaucracy. So if they're talking about a bill about education, it's probably a good idea to get somebody from what? The Department of Education in there. So they usually testify during congressional hearings. So this is the Department of Education testifying during a congressional hearing about an education bill. So they testify during congressional hearings. They provide their expertise because that's what the federal bureaucracy is for. 
They're experts of <coughs> This question. Federal agencies, departments implement legislation. Not really a question. <laughs> so the, this is supposed to say how? how do federal agencies and departments implement legislation and other federal policies? They are given two types of authority, they are given two types of power to make sure that they implement policy correctly or they implement policy or they're given power to implement and enforce policy. Number one, rulemaking authority, and number two, discretionary authority. So let's talk about rulemaking authority first. We talked about this already. This is making regulations. Rulemaking authority. Federal bureaucracies have the authority to make regulations, to make rules. Federal bureaucracies have the authority to make regulations or rules. And again, these regulations are called administrative law. Why? Because they carry the force of law and violating them mean consequences. All right. Give you an example. Let's say Congress tomorrow makes a bill about food. And they said, we want more obese people in the United States. This is the law. That's a legislation. We want to decrease obesity in the United States. That's the goal of this legislation. This legislation, this policy, is going to be given to who? After it's passed, it's going to be given to the FDA, to an agency, and the job of the FDA is to come up with regulations to achieve that goal. What's the goal again? To decrease what? Obesity. Obesity. So if you are the FDA, what kind of rules can you make? What kind of regulations on the food and drug industry can you make? Tax. Much higher. Tax, like um, high calorie content food, much higher, maybe? What else? Maybe try to limit fast food. Maybe um, uh, make ca um, canned food companies show their what? Calories. Their calories on the back. Make rules like that. Make regulations like that. Smaller serving. So their job is to create rules and regulations for certain industries. So they can force, for example, they can make a rule that says McDonald's are not allowed to serve three three um, quarter pounders. I don't. Know, I forgot what they're called. <laughs> Big Macs. Big Macs to to customers, for example. There, there's a limit. There's a regulation. I like the sizes of the clothes or something. Exactly. Yeah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You can just get, have a big map. It's better. <laughs> All right. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> so let's do this in the 1990s. Uh, there was a big concern, especially with moms, about people dying in car accidents needlessly. Because before the 1990s, there wasn't a law about what? Seatbelts. Seat belts. And car companies didn't have to provide seatbelts. There was no regulations about that. So Congress makes a policy. The goal is to reduce deaths in car accidents. They give that policy to the Department of what? Department oh. of Transportation. Transportation. Wow. The Department of Transportation they then makes a rule that all companies, all car companies, have to provide what? So that's a regulation. And that's going to enable them to meet the goal. Any questions? That's what regulations are for. That's what rules are for. Who can check this, by the way? Congress? No, the judicial branch. Judicial branch. What can they do to these regulations? They can declare them unconstitutional. Judicial review. Congress might make a policy today that says we want to reduce carbon emissions in the United States by 50%. And that, that law or that legislation, the, the goal of that legislation will be assigned to who? The, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And the EPA can say, okay, we're going to kill all the Mexicans in the United States so they stop breathing carbon dioxide. Immediately, somebody's going to complain about it, or what can the court do? Declare that regulation unconstitutional. All right, another authority that they're given is discretionary authority. Alright, I'll give you a definition, so follow along. Discretionary authority is an agency's ability to exercise its own expertise and judgment when implementing policy. Again, discretionary authority 
<coughs> is the ability of an agency to exercise its own expertise and judgment when implementing policy. Again, discretionary authority is an agency exercising its own judgment and expertise when implementing policy. So usually, guys, all Congress does is make the law, make the policy. The president may be issue an executive order, but it is up to the agency to figure out the way, make decisions to implement that particular policy. Give me the reason why. How come bureaucratic agencies nowadays are given so much discretion, so much freedom, to do what they want when it comes to implementing and enforcing a policy? Because they're experts. Because they are the experts, exactly. Congress, the president, may not know how to achieve a certain goal, but if you give it to an agency filled with experts, they are going to know. So you need to give them a lot of discretion, you need to give them a lot of freedom to exercise their own expertise, to exercise their own judgment when it comes to um, implementing or enforcing a policy or achieving the goal of that policy. So they're given a lot of discretion because they have the expertise, hopefully, they have the expertise. The policymaker may not know how that policy goal is going to be achieved, but the bureaucrats can. When do they have a lot of discretion? When do they have a lot of freedom to do what they want so that they can achieve the goal of the policy? Let's say this is a law passed by Congress. We're going to give it to an agency or a department so that we can achieve the goal of this legislation, correct? Yes. How do we give the agency more discretion, more freedom to implement or enforce this policy the way they want to do it, the way they feel that it should be achieved? Make it very vague. Make the, make the legislation very, not broad. detailed, very broad. So here's what we want. Do whatever you want to achieve what we want. That make sense? So your, your mom, tomorrow, let's pretend your mom is the policy maker. Let's say she's going on vacation. Your mom issues a policy to you. Clean the house. Right? That's a very vague policy. You can clean it like a normal person, and you can execute the policy the way a normal person would do it, by cleaning systematically with a mop or a broom. Or you can also invite thieves to your house <laughs> to clean your house. Or you can cause a flash flood and carry it but you're given a lot of discretion because the policy that your mom gave you is what? It's very big. So if you're a policy maker like Congress, for example, how do you limit discretion? Make it less vague. Make it less vague. So this is the policy and this is how we want you to execute this policy. At 1 p.m. you're going to clean your room with this instrument. At 2 p.m. you're going to clean the kitchen with this instrument. This is how we want it done. So you can make it very detailed as a policy maker. So if you're Congress, you need to make your laws more detailed. If you're the president, you, make, you need to make your executive orders more detailed. If you're the courts, you need to make your what more detailed? Your decisions or your rulings more detailed. Any questions about that? So why are they given discretion? Because they are the experts. When do they have more discretion? When the policy is vague? When the policy is not too detailed? So what is the result of discretionary authority? This may limit the policymaker's influence over how their policy is executed. This may limit Congress, the president, or the court's influence over how their policy is implemented. They may not want that. Congress may want to have their policy implemented the way they want it to be implemented. So bureaucratic discretion or discretionary authority can limit the influence of the policymakers how their policy, how their baby gets executed by the agencies or by the departments. And again, you can curtail that by making the policy more detailed, explaining how you want it to be enforced so that the, the agency doesn't fill in the details and the agency doesn't have a lot of leeway when it comes to enforcing that. But you may not want it to become more detailed because you're not the what? Expert. You're not the expert and your policy might fail because you're doing it by, you're, you're telling them how to enforce it instead of letting them exercise their expertise in how to enforce it. Any questions? How do we make school food better? <laughs> All right, you have homework tonight.
Oh, by the way, if you haven't done your homework, guys, it's for two quiz grades. And another thing, if you would like to, those of you that failed your FRQ tomorrow, from here, make sure you retest. Watch that video, please, if you haven't. There's an FRQ video specifically talking about the FRQ. <coughs> If you would like to retake your multiple choice for a better grade, again, not probably not going to be the same question. Come here. I'm going to make you do a retest on Tuesday, probably Tuesday. And come here with somebody. Doesn't matter if they got an A or not. Come here with somebody and tutor each other. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. I know. I I Guys, some of you are naughty, you haven't done your multiple choice yet, make sure you come by and do that. No, I can do it. Think about it, we're closer to Christmas now. That's the next Thank you, though. <laughs> Yeah, like, okay, so I was trying to clean up 
I was thinking about like the guy was really songs. Like, you know, let me know the songs I don't know anymore. Like, what's the point? Right? I've listened to them, I don't know, oh, 185 songs. I don't understand. I was, I was listening to them, and it would start, and I'm like, do I know this one? And then, like, five seconds in, I I know the beat, I know the lyrics, I know the lyrics, so I'm like, I know all 185 songs. So my musical playlist is 2,000 songs. Do you have any other questions? I don't know. Hello. Candy is always my favorite. Stop yelling at me. It's only $87 for the CD. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Those special tickets. I really want to watch it. Ridiculous. Get the weekend to study for that one. Okay. You said you were coming in the afternoon, right? Wait, let me make this one. Okay, so I said something like that. Well, I'm scared. I'm going like this. Yeah. Yeah. So you can take wow. the region. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So what, what can you conclude that the Northern States spent more money than the South? Can you please it so Should I buy this one? Maybe population, maybe wealthier, maybe they care more about education, right? Just draw a conclusion about Should I buy this one? Or similar. Should I buy this book? I love this book. Just care more. It's like can I buy this book? I love it. Yeah, if you want to buy it, buy it. You just said I love it, then buy it. I love this book so much. Please tell me. Please validate. Should I buy this book? 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 Should I buy that's why I got them $20, isn't that expensive? $20. What? I throw like $60 down on a game easy. Well, that's because you're crazy. What? <laughs> Sorry, catch. Uh, look. Original. Pros <laughs> <Pearls> up. <laughs> no, it works for me when Mr. Lerma throws his keys at me. I get so scared. <laughs> <laughs> what? So she to ask the big game. <laughs> One time he threw them really hard and I was like, it was like a good point. I'm not going to catch these. So I just let them fall and he was like, what the heck?